the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network presents Getting God's Help with Father Benedict Rochelle. Now, Father Rochelle. How do you get God's help in your life? I'm Father Benedict Rochelle of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal from the South Bronx in New York. And this is the beginning of a new series on getting God's help. And I hope that you'll enjoy it. It's 10 segments. We'll be doing it in the coming weeks. Hope it will give you something to help you get God's help. As most of you know, and most of you have been praying for me, I had a serious accident some months ago. And for the first month, I don't remember anything. I was apparently awake and conscious, able to communicate, but I don't remember a thing. But when I do begin to remember, I remember the first question I was asking myself. I better start praying. I, I better pray. And who did I pray to? I prayed to the Holy Spirit the Spirit of God, the third person of the Blessed Trinity, because he would teach me to pray. Our Lord tells us that the Holy Spirit prays within us. And I thought, I'm so confused, I'm so weak, I'm so down, that I better grab on to the Holy Spirit. And since that time, I've been very, very much aware of the necessity of turning prayer toward the Holy Spirit and allowing him to guide, to pray, or as St. Paul says, to speak with unspeakable desire in the center of my heart. And you can do this. It's amazing how many people, lay people, even religious, think that they can't pray very well. And they, they don't think much about prayer. They get other people to pray for them. The fact is, we should all pray. And who do I mean by we? I mean everybody listening to this series. After my accident, I became very well aware that there are tremendous numbers of people who listen to EWTN who are not Catholics, who may not even be Christians. I got cards, get well cards, emails from Jewish people, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, all sorts of people. And they watch EWTN. It's kind of amazing. And uh, I don't want to leave anybody out of these programs. So the Christians, Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, the Jews, the Muslims, the Hindus, the Buddhists. I want to include everybody, and I want to say things that will be personally helpful to you. It's not my decision who belongs to what religion. That's the decision of God, of the Holy Spirit. And because I am very obviously a very firmly committed Catholic. I think ours is the church that Christ started, but it's a church obviously made up of poor sinners, which is like the Twelve Apostles. But it's not for me to tell other people what to do. I rely on the Holy Spirit. And if I can help you, whatever your denomination is, or whoever you are, to listen to the Spirit of God in your life, then this program will be worthwhile. Now let's say a little bit about the Holy Spirit. Our Divine Savior, Jesus Christ, speaks about the Holy Spirit often, but he mostly speaks about him during the Last Supper. This is right the night before Christ died. Uh, in John 14, he says, Truly I say to you, he's talking to the apostles, whoever believes in me 
will do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's the first rule. If you want to get the help of God, you must keep the commandments of God. And Jesus says, I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, and he dwells within you, and he will be in you. I'm going to make the assumption that everyone watching this program wants to be at peace with God. I want to make the assumption that everyone watching this program wants to obey God. And I mean obey God, not come up with opinions about what God wants or does not want. That's kind of chancy. But I mean to obey God, the teachings of God the teachings of Christ and the Bible, the teachings of God as they are communicated to us by the saints of the church. Now, it is extremely important that if uh, you're trying to do the work of God, you're going to have trouble. If you want to lead a godly life, even some of your relatives will be annoyed at you some of your friends. You'll annoy people. We live in a more and more paganistic culture right now, and those who try to do the will of God are going to be more and more annoying to people. It may even get dangerous. And Christ says this. He says, they hated me without a cause. But when the Counselor comes, whom I will send you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me, and you also are my witnesses, because I have been with you from the beginning. Jesus calls the Spirit of God the Counselor. In modern English, we call him the Paraclete. That is an interesting word for you. This word technically means a defense lawyer. It's a Greek word. And the paraclete was the person who in court stood next to you. Para. Parallel. And the paraclete stood there and he helped you defend yourself. And he defended you. And he gave you counsel on what to do. I think we ought to think about that. Because we live in confusing times. I hardly ever watch anything on television except once in a while if I'm visiting somebody I watch EWTN. But I was on a little vacation and I watched a little of the news. And now I'm a person who never watches it. How confusing. How terribly confusing. And I'm sitting there watching this stuff and I'm saying, where is the truth? Because where the truth is not, you can't find God. What is the truth? Now, Jesus tells us that the paraclete or the Holy Spirit will come to us because he'll send him to us. He says, I did not see these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is up to your advantage that I go away. And if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you and when he comes, he will convince the world of sin, of righteousness, 
and of judgment. This is in John chapter 16. And it's right on the eve of the death of Christ. If you saw the film, The Passion of Christ, this was an hour or two before the sequence of events in that film takes place. Jesus speaks of the counselor, the paraclete, whom he will send. And where is he, the paraclete? He's everywhere, but he's not in the world, because the world will not have him. It sends him away. And when I was watching the news, I thought to myself, if I was the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't know how to get through to these people because they're not interested in the truth. And once you decide you're not interested in the truth, then there's no hope. You have to be interested in the truth. A very obvious example is the question of abortion. Over and over again, I have been told in my many years in the pro-life movement that an embryo, an unborn child, is not a human being. That's just a plain, big, fat lie. That's all it is. It's not a monkey. It's not a chimpanzee. It's a human being. and. In the 25 or 30 years that the struggle's been going on, I've seen medical science more and more clarify the fact that the embryonic child from very early on is a human being. Recently, I saw some marvelous pictures done with sonogram of a child 12 weeks from conception. And he looked like he was all ready to talk to you moving and it happens that a number of people who have been convinced to have an abortion see the sonogram pictures and they can't do it because they're looking at a child that's the truth but if a person turns away from the truth then the holy spirit cannot be with them he can't get through he can't get any place. And this is something that is one of those rare things that you might call an impossibility to God. God will not do something for someone who does not want him to do it. You may recall that when our Lord went to Nazareth, his hometown, he could not work many signs there, many miracles, because of their unbelief. Now, if the Holy Spirit is, as I say, going through life in the world around us, but he can't get through where there's no truth, then how can I say that I hope that everyone who is listening to this program is open to the Holy Spirit. Uh, some people will say to me, well, there's people listening to this program who are not baptized. That's true. But God is not bound by his own ordinances. I've known a number of people who were not baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity, a Christian sacrament. They were not baptized because God did not give them the faith to seek baptism. But they were good and devout people, and they had a goodness beyond the goodness of nature. And I have known people who were baptized and received a lot of other sacraments who were not good because they were holding God off by untruth. Now, in our series, we're going to talk about something very, very unusual, almost to the viewpoint of being slightly spooky. And this is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and he gives certain abilities, certain gifts to people that go beyond their physical and mental 
psychological, and even spiritual abilities. He picks them up. You must have heard the Charismatics had that hymn. He will pick you up like eagle wings. My goodness. And I, I'm, I'm not a member of the Charismatic movement. I'm very friendly to it. I'd rather keep silent in tongues. But I know there's lots of Charismatics and ex-Charismatics and fallen away Charismatics, Protestant and Catholic, who watch this program, Pentecostals, and they're all saying, well, I have the Holy Spirit. I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Be careful. If you want to turn them off, stay away from the truth. But if you want to have him, whoever you are, listen to this series, and I'm going to tell you about these marvelous gifts. I'll give you the names. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, courage or fortitude, piety or loyalty, and the fear of God or reverence. And Jesus speaks about these when he's a very young man at Nazareth, when he speaks in the synagogue, and he's invited to give, read the reading from the prophet. He reads this from the prophet Isaiah, and we'll go into that later. During these programs, I'm also going to talk to you about the Pentecostal charismatic movement. A few years ago, this movement was extremely strong and powerful. I'm going to give you a little of its startling history. And uh, part of that startling history, which Catholics don't know, is that a gigantic charismatic event happened in the Catholic Church practically at the same time that Protestants began the Pentecostal movement. Some very strange but true things here. And I think Catholics who don't feel comfortable with the charismatic movement need to be told that the Pope, Pope John Paul II, received the Charismatics in St. Peter's and congratulated them on their fervor and their loyalty, and their loyalty to God. At the same time, practically, the Archbishop of Canterbury, head of the Anglican Communion, received the Anglican Charismatics in Canterbury Cathedral. Oh, we got some very interesting things. And also, if you can think during this series of some extraordinary people that you know, and you look at them from the viewpoint of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you're going to see, ah, that's what's going on. Let me say a little bit about gifts. We have good qualities. Sometimes we have them from nature, a nice disposition, a friendly way. They're not Christian virtues. They're just something nice that somebody has. Nobody's all nice, I assure you. Everybody has deep wounds and pains and sorrows and faults. But you meet a person who's perhaps had a very good upbringing a very peaceful home, and you'll find that they may have a lot of natural dis good dispositions. Or they may have come out of a tough situation and surprise everybody by being friendly and generous and open. Those are called natural virtues. The most recognized of them all is courage. Then there are what are called the moral virtues, the Christian moral virtues. And these virtues are qualities of a person who receives them from Christ. They're disciples of Christ. And that's important. And I've known some very, very virtuous people who somehow or other, I don't figure this out, were not Christians who had these qualities. I used to have a friend, Lord of mercy on him, he's deceased, Rabbi Lubliner, and I used to hit him on the shoulder and say, 
Manny, you're one of the best Christians I know, because he was a man of virtue. Now, these virtues are gifts of God, and they contribute to our salvation, to our holiness. Prudence, justice, temperance, uh, courage, these are very good qualities. Almost everybody recognizes them. And to be moral virtues, they have to be related to the kingdom of God. A person has to be prudent about their life insofar as it leads them to eternal life. It prepares them for the last judgment. If somebody is just prudent about their life and doesn't take into account that they're going to be before the judgment seat of God, they're not prudent, they're just clever. If they're brave, but brave in doing dumb things, they're not really courageous. Uh, they're a little on the wild side. Christian moral virtues are remarkable things, but the person must have the intention of pleasing God. But I want to tell you, you wouldn't get very far that way, because our virtues wear out. We don't accomplish spiritually what we'd like to. And uh, I could tell you this, I've been at the spiritual life 65 years, and I got lots of holes in my socks. But there are the gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And these don't come from our efforts, they come down. God can take a foolish person and make them wise. The Holy Spirit can take a coward and make him brave. He can instruct the ignorant. He can inform people. He can do all kinds of things. And I see this happening more and more with young people at our time. They're raised on the garbage of the media, which teaches them to be only exploitative of other people, particularly sexually exploitative, teaches them to be selfish, teaches them to be only preoccupied with themselves, and they shock you because they come out with ideals, and they're usually profoundly converted back to God. Some of the young brothers and sisters in our Franciscan community will get up in front of a church full of people and give a witness talk about the bad life they used to lead and how the Holy Spirit called them to change. The Holy Spirit, as Jesus says, reminds us of what he taught. Some people don't even need to be reminded. They need to be taught at the first time because they didn't pay attention. I'm very astonished. And when our brothers and sisters go to Europe to preach to young people in Germany and England and France, we get the same thing. There's more faith, vibrant, lively faith among some of the young than there is any place else in Europe. And this is because of the Holy Spirit. In your home, in your family, in your own life, if you want to be renewed, if you want to come to life, if you want to get away from the past and leave it back there, whoever you are, I don't care what denomination you are, pray to the Holy Spirit. Say to him, Holy Spirit, come, come and be with me and teach me the way and I will be changed and you will be changed. You've been listening to Getting God's Help with Father Benedict Groeschel. Join us again next time on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network.